You ever do a thing and your heart just immediately sinks? This is one of those such moments. So I was teaching a class, a seminar, a demonstration a week or two ago, and we were talking about edge profiling using a router versus a spoke shave. And I had my multiple spoke shaves, right? I have my Veritas, I have a couple of older ones, and I have this, which is undoubtedly my favorite spoke shave. This is an old Stanley 62, 64. And it's just been a workhorse for me. It's the perfect size, it's the perfect weight. It's a tap set, so I can just kind of adjust things on the fly by snapping it on the bench. And it just, in my opinion, is damn near a perfect tool. And so they were asking me, well, how do you adjust it? There's no adjustment levers at the top. And I said, well, you can take a hammer and you can tap it on either side, top or bottom, to adjust the blade back or forth. But what I normally do is I just take it and I... And as I did that, it just exploded. It just exploded into three pieces right after I got done saying that not only is it my favorite tool, but it's been an indestructible workhorse for me for over a decade. And the room paused. Every silence, a hush fell over the crowd. And then we all had a chuckle. And I picked up my Veritas and I said, this is my favorite spoke shape. Because what else are you going to do in that moment but move on? But nonetheless, I was devastated. And a few folks in the crowd did follow me, they know about this tool, they know about my affinity for that particular spoke shave. And before I even got done with the demonstration, they had already sent me a link to a couple of potential options on eBay to purchase a replacement for this tool. And so, that's what we're gonna do today. So as you can see, this is completely sealed. I haven't opened this box yet. I haven't looked at the tool inside yet. So we're gonna do that on camera together. We're gonna take an initial look at this thing and see what kind of shape it's in. But before we do that, I will say, it was surprisingly difficult to find this exact tool. Now the 64 comes in kind of several different iterations. I imagine those are just different generations of the tool though it was easy to find history of the 151, which is this tool with the adjustment levers, that's the more popular version. Finding a history of the 64 was almost impossible. I spent a few hours on the Googs trying to figure out where this tool iterated, when it was first released, and what the different generations were. And when I say generations, I mean just like every other tool that Stanley releases, and just like several tool companies now, They'll make an iteration, they'll release that for a few years, and then they'll make an improvement or a change in the design. Generally speaking, it's an improvement until some period after World War II, and then they generally became not improvements. But each one of those is called a generation. So the one that I found most often is this indentation in the back of the casting was actually moved to the front of the casting, and I've seen those, I picked those up, and I just don't like the way they feel in my hand. I much prefer this indentation in the back of the casting, and it just seems to be a place to rest my fingers. It doesn't make much sense to me ergonomically to place that in the front. So that was kind of the biggest difference that I saw online between all of the 64s I saw, and then I really only found two that were this exact iteration, and one of them seemed to be in really bad shape, and I didn't feel like restoring that from nothing. And then I think I found one that's in halfway decent shape. So that's a brief history of the 64. Very, very inept, incomplete, but here we are. So let's take a look at what I actually have in this box. So, at first glance, they seem to be exactly what I was hoping for, identical iterations of the tool. This one, of course, has not been restored, so it looks a little older, looks a little funkier. The paint is in better condition than this one was in when I bought it, but that's just aesthetic. I'm not worried about that paint job at all. We could always repaint it if we wanted to. 
The components are a little rustier, obviously, on mine. The thumb screw is in better condition than on the new one. The blade has a little bit of rust, and this blade is sticking out for days. What, what is happening there? Holy guacamole, Batman. Holy rusted metal, Batman! Huh? But, again, that's not affecting anything. Oh, and fun fact, the blade is upside down in this. I don't know if you can see that. Let's see if we can focus up. See how the bevel of the blade is facing up? That should be facing down. Fun, interesting, love that, love that energy. So, the reason I wanted, primarily, the exact same iteration as my old one is because my blade is in great condition. My blade's already sharp, it's already removed all of the pitting that was on there when I bought the tool, so I should be able to just swap this blade in for that one, and that removes probably 60% of the work in restoring this old tool, but, We'll go over how to do that just so that you guys have that information. But on the whole, I even have the same stamping on the back here. So you can see on the back of this one, there is that stamp right here that says made in USA. And on this one, I have that same stamp made in USA. So by all accounts, I have the exact same tool. I'm very happy with that. This casting, which is the main thing that I need, obviously, seems to be in excellent condition. I think what I'm going to do is just kind of buff it out, get a little steel wool, maybe a little wax, maybe a little three-in-one, something like that, and uh, just clean it up so it looks nice and feels nice. But it seems like even the bottom on here, the bottom has just a little bit of light surface rust. See if we can focus up on that. A little bit of light surface rust on the bottom, but... It seems to be in really good condition. So let's dismantle it, see what the interior parts look like and see how much work it's actually gonna take to clean up. So on the whole, this is in really good condition. It's not gonna take too much work to restore this tool. There are a couple of key things that I really wanna take care of because it's going to help the tool to function much better over the long haul. Number one, these tools were always cast and then painted after the fact, resulting in this little bit of the bedding here being covered in paint. It's not the end of the world, it's not going to like really mess up the tool, but it is better if, like on my old one, it's better if you remove the paint from the bedding of the tool so that the blade sits flat on that surface and isn't forced into any awkward positions or slipping on the paint over time. So I'm gonna take a file, just a rough mill file or a bastard file, and I'm gonna clean that up. Obviously we wanna clean up the bed of this uh, plane, the sole of this plane. I should note, the bed and the sole are different. I was just talking about cleaning up the bed. And then this, of course, is the sole, so don't be confused by the fact that my mouth says the wrong word sometimes. We're gonna clean up the sole of the plane. That's gonna be super simple. You could do that with a file, but I'll just take a piece of sandpaper and just clean that up like I would a normal bench plane of some kind. Other than that, everything else on the casting itself is in great shape. Like I said, I'm probably going to take a little bit of 4 aught steel wool and maybe a little bit of three-in-one light machine oil and just kind of rub it down so that it feels smooth because right now it kind of feels a little old and sticky like it's been sitting in a garage for a few decades. So I want to get rid of that just so the tactile feel of this tool is as nice as my old one was, which is nice and worn and feels like it gets used regularly. The blades, of course, are in the, the most difference of shape. That's what... what Words are hard today for some reason. The blades look different is what I'm trying to say. This one obviously is rusty, but there's no pitting. There's not a lot of deep surface undulations in there from the rust. So that would be a really easy cleanup. A little bit of sandpaper on both sides and then reshaping that bevel really wouldn't take that long. We may jump into that, but in reality, I'm just gonna switch out this blade because I already have this thing lickety split perk. Bear with me today. It's perfect, the blade is in great condition, so we're just gonna swap that out. Now, the cap irons. The cap irons are in pretty similar condition. This is in really good shape. 
the key things with the cap iron like this, these were always hollowed out because what you want more than anything else, if it's not going to be perfectly flat, is for contact at the toe, at the blade, and then contact at the back so that it's being held tight in two positions. That's why these were always concave. And so the only thing I would need to do to this is what I've already done to this, which is just take a little sandpaper on a flat surface and make sure that the two points of contact are nice and flat so that you get a good clean lock when this thing is actually locked in place. And then the thumb screw, there's nothing wrong with this thumb screw, just a little bit of machine oil and 4 aught steel wool to bring up the shine. That's just aesthetic purposes. And again, that tactile feel, it has that kind of dusty, crusty feel to it, which nobody likes. So that's what we're gonna do. I'm gonna say, I'm gonna take care of those handful of steps, and then we're gonna see if we can't assemble this tool and see how it's cutting. Cue the music. So, the process is done. Everything looks good, everything feels good. I've got all of the components to the place where I need them to be, so let's do a quick comparison from how this looks to what the old one looks like. So, first of all, in real time, this probably took maybe 30 minutes, maybe. And that includes filming, setting up the camera, different angles, doing some things. It didn't take a lot of work. I started with the sole of this plane, just a 600 grit on a piece of tile, and it didn't take a lot to get this to a point where it looked absolutely beautiful. Now, one thing I do wanna point out is there are a few marks around the edges. That's not the end of the world. Don't worry about everything being super clean and perfect. If I would say 90 to 95% of the sole is flat and clean, that's all you need. If there are a couple of dings and dents here and there, that's just aesthetic. You may lose sleep over it if you're a little OCD, but it's not gonna affect the function of the tool. As long as the toe in front of the action and the heel behind the cutting action are clean, the sole's gonna work perfectly. That's where I'm at, I'm happy with that. The bedding of this tool is now clean and free of paint. Everything looks good and feels good in that regard, again, not absolutely spick and pan, spick and pan. Pan and spick, spick and span, Mr. Clean, it's perfect, but it's functionally good, okay? And that's what we're looking for when we're doing some restorations like this, at least for our purposes as woodworkers. So the casting itself, after I gave it a little rub down with the three-in-one in four-aught steel wool, looks good, feels good, that's perfect. Our thumb screw looks good, feels good. This is purely aesthetic as long as the threads are in good condition and aren't gunked up with any schmutz. That is perfect. And yes, schmutz is the word I intend to use there. And lastly, our blade. Now, the back side of the blade doesn't actually matter what condition it's in. This actually does have a little bit of pitting on the back, but I'm not losing sleep over that because the back doesn't affect the cutting action at all. The face of the blade that is exposed upward is nice and clean, and you know that this is the way that this is oriented in the tool because every tool company will always stamp the top of their blade. So this looks good, and yes, there are some mill marks still in the middle of this blade, but realistically, this is a spoke shave. I'm not using this all that often and I'm sharpening it even less so. So I've got probably a good 3 eighths of an inch from the cutting edge to where those mill marks start. That's going to take me maybe a decade to blow through. Like it's gonna take a long time to remove that much steel each time I sharpen. So I'm not gonna worry about that. And if and when it does get to the point where I need to reuse that, I can simply go back and keep flattening and remove more steel to expose a good cutting edge there. So that's not a thing to worry about. Where it meets the cutting edge is in excellent condition and that's the important part. And then of course our bevel, which we've not yet touched, 
is not gonna take that much work. That's probably in pretty good condition. It looks reasonably flat. There's no major dings. So we will restore this blade to cutting action. We can do that in a moment, but just in full disclosure, I am probably gonna swap out that blade because I have that blade where I like it at the angle that I want it. It's ground, it's ready to be put back into my sharpening jig. So just full disclosure, we will get this one cutting though. So our last and final step is of course to get that blade ready to cut. So we're just gonna do that on sandpaper. It's gonna be pretty rough and simple. I'm gonna use the 600 grit that I already have on there to get this thing cutting. And then we're gonna see how it actually functions. perfect. It's part. It's exactly what my old one was doing. It looks good. It feels good. It's cutting beautifully. And the restoration took an hour and a half. And that's from the start of filming this video when I'm standing here talking to you guys to the time it is right now. It was less than 90 minutes. It was about 85 minutes or so, an hour 25. And for those of you who are gonna ask, yes, it was just 600 grit sandpaper that I used on that tile and then straight to a strop with whatever that compound is, somewhere around 15,000, I believe. And you can see the shavings I'm getting, the surface quality I'm getting on here is absolutely phenomenal. And that's really at the end of the day all that matters. Whatever your sharpening system is, it doesn't matter. It's the results you're getting from it. So for these purposes, in this circumstance, that's baller. That's exactly what I want. Now, let's do a quick rapid fire Q&A to talk about what happened to the old one and what's going to happen to the new one. So first and foremost, on the reason that this broke. This is, as I said earlier, a tap set spoke shave, meaning that the blade is locked in place and the way you adjust the blade up and down is to tap one side of the casting in order to jerk the blade back in place. This is the same techniques that's used in the Japanese style or the Eastern style wooden planes. It's been the same technique that was used in Western style planes until the invention of iron planes or steel planes and the adjustment mechanisms. But because this is tapped over and over what you are doing every time you hit it is you are creating a very small micro fissure in a fragile substance such as iron. These are all old iron castings, and over time, as you continue to whack on it, you're going to break it. Like, that's just what's happening. It's going to break eventually, and this is part of the reason, I believe, why ductile iron was invented. I don't know who invented it, but sometime in the 20th century, that's a more resilient iron, and so it can take a beating, it can be whacked, it can be dropped, and it's not going to break from the jerk, from the... the sudden undulations in this steel. That's not what I'm trying to say, but words seem to be very hard today, so that's what we're gonna go with. The ductile iron is less likely to break in this manner from repeated tap sets. So that's one advantage of newer tools. What's going to happen to this eventually is the exact same thing that happened to this. It may take 10 years, it may take 40 years, it may never happen. But if this is struck enough, the same fissures that are going to happen at the smallest part of the casting will weaken this piece of iron to the point where it breaks. That's just part of the life of the tool. You could probably adjust it by just fiddling with the little cap iron up here, but nobody actually does that because that takes way more time and it's way less accurate than just giving it a quick tap. Now the other thing that's gonna happen with this tool in pretty quick success <laughs> succession is that it's gonna end up looking like this in that the paint is all chipped off. And it's already happened. The first time I go to set this plane and I get a little bit of a chip right here because you're just hitting a very rigid paint that was sprayed on there a hundred years ago or so. 
And when I take my little hammer and I do one of those, it's just gonna chip that paint off. Now look, do I care? Not at all. Do you care? Maybe, I don't know you. You might, that might really bother you. You can get a more resistant paint and paint this to repair those chips. For me, that's just the use of the tool. It's kind of like when you have tarnished bronze on a tool, like those that I have up there. That doesn't bother me at all. It just tells me that you're using the bloody thing. So that's what's gonna happen to this tool in time. But from a functional standpoint, this is working brilliantly and I'm really, really happy with this tool. This is a great replacement for $45. This is $45. Helps if I put it right side up. $45. So this listing was originally at 45. I shot them an offer of 35 and then after shipping and tax, I did have it right side up. After shipping and tax, it ended up being 45 bucks. Now a new spoke shave is gonna run you, I don't know, 150 or so, somewhere in that, let's just say somewhere in the window of 100 to 200. So 45 bucks, an hour of work if you're not filming and you've got a beautiful tool that's going to last you probably the rest of your life because you're probably not using this tool as much as I am. Yours for the taking, yours for the choosing. There are other options, so let's talk about those real quick. So let's say you're in a situation where you say, Eric, that's wonderful, old tools are great, I love old Stanleys, but I don't wanna buy a new tool in 10 years. That seems stupid to me, and that's a fair point to make. And so you have the 151. Now this is a record version, but it's essentially identical to the old Stanley version. It's very, very similar to what we have going on here. The major difference, of course, is that you have these adjustment levers, okay? These are going to basically make life a little bit easier to adjust one side down versus the other. They also have these nice, really uh, soft flats here, which makes the tool really easy to push. I don't like them in a pulling motion. That's one of my gripes with this particular tool, the old record version, at least. But the number 151 is gonna do you just right. The restoration process is very much the same as what we just did. And this is a tool that I have used in the past, but I don't particularly care for the ergonomics of it. Just a personal preference thing, choose your own adventure. Now, if you want a newer version of that, I do highly recommend the Veritas. I think this is one of the best spoke shaves on the market. I think it's fantastic. It does have a couple of flats here again, so it's really nice in the pushing motion, but those flats are less exaggerated and the round handles make it comfortable to pull as well. So I do really, really like this tool. This is the older iteration. I think I've had this for 10 or 12 years. So they look a little sleeker maybe now, this bottom is rounded out a little bit. It's not quite as sharp on the bottom, uh, but the tool functions exactly the same. And as you can see, they are essentially the same as the old 151. So if you wanna spend a little bit more money and get a great tool that absolutely will last you the rest of your life and your child and probably your grandchild's life, this is a great tool. I do not own the Lee Nielsen version of it, which is a tap set like the 64 but I've used that many, many, many times in my life, and that's also a wonderful tool. So if you like the tap set, which I personally do, but you want one that's going to withstand the impact of setting over and over again, those are made out of brass, which is a softer material, and therefore won't take those micro fissures when you go to tap set it. It's a wonderful tool, highly recommend. All right, rapid fire Q&A about restoring spoke shaves. Let's go. Working metal at a woodworking bench, is that a good idea? I mean, listen, I admit, probably not, but also people get a little too finicky. This is still a woodworking bench. It is a bench to be used for work. So if you're working metal on the surface, do be aware if you don't clean it, those metal filings and shavings can be embedded into your work. And if you have a highly reactive tannic wood like oak, cherry, etc., that may imbue black spots in the future. So yes, I work metal on this bench, Sometimes, if I was doing a lot of it, I would do it somewhere else, but in order to get rid of that, I literally just take a sponge and some soapy water and I wipe it down, I clean the surface and it's gonna be fine. Take a deep breath, we're gonna get through this okay. How flat is flat enough? It's an excellent question. It is a thing to beware, but it's not a thing to really lose any sleep over. Like I said earlier, you have this surface, as long as the majority of that surface is clean, that's flat enough. You don't need to worry about making this thing Eiffel Tower flat. Mm. 
That doesn't make any sense whatsoever. But you know what I mean. We're not engineering things. We are making things out of wood. If it is flat enough to make a flat-ish surface, it's good. Using a tile is an excellent example of that. So, is a tile really flat enough to sharpen on? Now, you saw me using just a 12 by 12 tile from the big box stores to do my flattening and my sharpening in this situation. And listen, yes, it's not perfectly flat. It's not going to be to within a 10 thousandth of an inch flat, but it's flat enough. Guys, again, this is woodworking. If you have the money to go pay $200 for a granite slab that's flatter than a tile, great, do that. There's nothing wrong with that. I own one of those and I've never used it because the $3 tile that I got from the big orange box store several years ago has been flat enough for me to flatten my tools and flatten my sharpening stones and I get great results from there. So if you are worried about it, fine, go spend the money. If you're not worried about it, I'm telling you right now, it's flat enough. You use the mill file to flatten the bed of the tool. What if you don't own a mill file? Well, first of all, mill files aren't expensive. So if you don't own a mill file, go buy one. You can buy one for like 10 bucks. You're not gonna lose really crucial money over that. Woodworking is far more expensive than a mill file. But if you don't own one and you need to restore it now, you can of course just take a piece of wood and double stick or spray adhesive some sandpaper on there and use that. I've done that many, many times. Also, diamond paddles are a really nice alternative. They're more expensive than a mill file, but they are great for getting something absolutely flat and shaped exactly how you need it to be in a place where maybe a mill file is a little bit bulky or not quite accurate enough. Lastly, why use three-in-one oil? Well, three-in-one oil is a wonderful resource to have. I always have multiple bottles in the shop. It's just a light machine oil and it does two things. Number one, it kind of acts as a rust preventative because you are abrading steel and exposing new steel to moisture and oxygen and that creates rust. So using a three-in-one oil is going to help prevent that rust, but also it just acts as a, a, lu a, lubri a lubricative, a, lubri a lubricative. Listen, guys, it's a rough one today, all right? Just, it's the holidays still, just bear with me. It is a lubricant that allows you to abrade the surface a little bit smoother. So when I'm using the three-in-one in combination with the 4 aught steel wool, then that's just allowing me to kind of polish the surface a little bit more, remove any of the gunk that's there with that wet sand, and then just polish it up because that 4 aught steel wool is so fine. And also it allows you to lubricate things like the threads on the thumb screw. So just get a bottle of three in one and keep it around. It's good for everything. Hey, future Eric here, jumping on very briefly to interrupt past Eric for a couple of quick announcements that I'm very excited to share with you guys before we get out of here. First and foremost, I have a Patreon now. So if you're a fan of this channel, if you're a fan of my work across multiple platforms and you're looking for a way to support what I do, Patreon is the best way to do that. There's already a vibrant community of folks over there who are wonderful and supportive and I'm deeply, deeply grateful to who want to see this channel continue to grow. And I am going to take the funds from Patreon that are from you guys and I'm going to apply them directly to this channel to make sure that I can continue to give you guys my best effort and decent content. I hope it's halfway okay. That's the aim for 2024 and that's a great avenue for you guys to support my work. So I'll leave a link down in the description below if that's something you're interested in checking out. Now secondly, and equally as excitingly, excitingly, equally as exciting, I'm excited to tell you guys about the fact that, I promise I'm not getting naked right now. There's new shirts, go make a thing. The thing that you guys have been asking me to make, a go make a thing t-shirt is finally available over on Bonfire. I will also leave a link in the description below for that. So if that's something you want to do to support the channel as well, you can go buy some merch. Wear it loud and proud. It's brand spanking new. It's comfy. It's cozy. And I hope it inspires you to get in the shop and go make a thing. Now that that's out of the way, back to our, reg back to our regularly scheduled programming. And so, friends, that is how you restore a spoke shave. It's a very simple process. It's essentially just sanding steel until things are flat and seated properly and your blade is sharp. Now, this was in 
phenomenal condition, even better condition than I expected it to be when I purchased it online. And so this process took no time at all. But also beware that I've been doing this for a while. I know how this process goes. I know what to look for and how to react when I see a thing. So it's probably going to take you a little bit longer. That doesn't mean that your tool is busted. That doesn't mean that it's a waste of money and time. It just means that you don't yet have the experience to see and analyze what's happening in real time and make adjustments. So cut yourself a little bit of grace. It's probably gonna be a little bit frustrating the first time you do it because you're gonna get it to a point where you think it's perfect and then you assemble it and you go to take a cut and something doesn't work and you then have to figure out what's not working. So take a deep breath, it's gonna be great. Once you get this tool working, it is going to work for a lifetime. It is going to give you a tremendous amount of experience in understanding what the tool is actually doing when you're using it and that will allow you to analyze this tool and other tools that you're doing, that you're using, so that you can have a greater understanding of what's actually happening. So take that for what it is. I hope this was helpful. I hope it was entertaining. I'm sure my inability to articulate my thoughts this week is a little bit more entertaining than as is normal, or maybe frustrating. I don't know. I was just making a tool work. So friends, go make a thing. I trust everybody's doing well. I trust everybody will get in the shop and enjoy their time in there. And of course, until next week, cheers.